The very first thing you learn about in a physics class is motion. The amazing thing is that all the different kinds of motion that we see here can be described using a very small number of concepts. In this episode of Everyday Science, we're going to learn about motion, but the show will be a bit different. Most of the show will take place at an amusement park. The young people on the show today are not only going to get a chance to see things in motion, they are going to be part of the experiments. The point is, of course, to have some fun. But it turns out that an amusement park is also a very good place to learn about motion. Here's an example that will be our everyday science quiz question for today. How is it possible for people riding a roller coaster to turn completely upside down without falling out of their seats? Stay motionless for a little while and you'll learn the answer to this and many other questions on this episode of Everyday Science. Welcome to another episode of Everyday Science. And this show is going to be about motion, but it's going to be a little bit different because the experiments that we're going to do aren't going to be in the studio. They're going to be on location at Six Flags Elitch Gardens. And the folks down there were good enough to let us come down and do some, I guess, do some physics experiments by riding the coasters and seeing sort of how it looked, but also how it felt. Before we do that, though, we're going to do a little bit of introduction to some of the topics. And I'm here in the studio with Brian Oliver. Hello again. Welcome Always back. Always glad to be back. And I can't think of a better place than to go do some uh, ex physics experiments than, than Six Flags down at Elitch Gardens. I agree. I mean, we always we say um, hands-on science is the way to go. And this is... <laughs> this fits the bill more than most. <laughs> it's hands-on. It's hands-on. <laughs> I'd say body-on even, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's... You, you have some ideas about how people learn. This might actually be a good way. Yeah. You know, we know from the research around learning that students learn best, and I think it's really not just our young people, but everybody learns best when they experience it, they do it, and it's very much hands-on. We use that term rather loosely a lot of times, but when we say that, we're saying that it's an experience. There's the doing involved. And um, I think when you you take students to a, a situation like this where their, their whole body is immersed in these concepts, that that's really important. Um, the standard really that you're getting at here is the physical science standard, and that's, I'm just going to read it. It says, describing, measuring, and calculating quantities that characterize moving objects and their interactions within a system. And their examples are force, velocity, acceleration, potential energy, and kinetic energy. So this is going to be very interesting to see how all of these concepts are intertwined into the, the rides down there. So that Excellent. should be interesting. Excellent. Well, let's go over some of the concepts just very briefly and sort of see how they'll come in. One of the things we'll talk about initially is the uh, forces, velocities, acceleration. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a key piece. Newton's first law tells us if you have an object which is at rest, it'll tend to remain at rest unless right. a force acts on it. Now, I have these hover pucks here, which have a little fan on the bottom. And I put them on the table, and it makes a relatively frictionless ride. And so the puck has very little force on it. It'll stay put unless I apply a force to it. And if I do that, the puck will move. And if you apply a force, it'll come back. And so we can knock the puck back and forth. But if one of us doesn't hold on to it, the puck will keep going. That's also the concept of inertia. Once things get moving, they keep on moving until a force comes along to make them stop. And that'll be a key for the types of things that we're looking at. One place where it comes up, which is the place where people don't necessarily think of it as applying, is when you look at uh, circular motion. These, uh, these uh, pucks will move in a straight line. But if you want something to move in a circle, so I can have this marble on this board, the marble will move in a circle. But when it gets to the edge of the circle, where there are the break in the circle, what it'll do is it'll keep on going in a straight line because there's no more force acting on it. If you want something to go in a circle, you've got to apply force to make that happen. 
And if you don't, things will continue to go in a straight line. So in this example, what's the force acting on that marble that makes it go in a, a circle? There's a force we call it, it's a centripetal force that it is, in this case, it's with the rubber gasket and it points in towards the center of the circle and keeps the marble going like that. Now another piece that you brought up was the whole energy components. And one of the interesting things that really amazed me when I first found out about roller coasters was they're essentially passive devices. Yeah. All the energy comes in at the beginning. There's no motor in a roller coaster. But what happens is you start out in your coaster up at some height and so you've got a certain amount of potential energy because of the fact that you're raised up um, and then you just roll. It's a roller coaster. It's just right. rolling and coasting all the way through. And so what happens is that potential energy converts to kinetic energy and you go around and hopefully, hopefully you have enough speed <laughs> to get around that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, you want to have a ride a little bit more carefully designed than this so that there's <laughs> enough potential energy to give you enough kinetic energy so that you have enough right. speed to make it around the circle. And actually if you could hold that down, I think we're losing a little bit of energy in the thing. Here we go. Close. Close enough? Close enough. All right. And so you'll make it, you'll make it around the loop. And uh, so we've got an energy transfer that happens, and you have to have sufficient energy to allow you to do the acrobatics and stuff that they'll see on the ride. Right. And we have a nice way of demonstrating that with this little box that we have right here. This is our uh, we have a little living room constructed inside this box. And if we look inside here, you can see what we've got set up is uh, we've got Grandma here on the sofa and yes. a little armchair. And next to her, we've got this little, little oh. shop of physics device. So grandma's a scientist, obviously, because <laughs> she's got a, got a little science apparatus in her it's living It's like room. magnets on a pencil. Exactly. And they push each other apart. And this will work for us like a little gravity indicator. Because the magnets are pushing each other apart, but gravity's pulling them down. If the effect of gravity decreases, they'll push each other farther right. apart. If effective mm -hmm. gravity increases, they'll get pulled closer together. So it would be like a gravity meter. And inside this box, we've got a little remote camera over here that will look through the box and see out the window. And so we'll be able to see through the box and, and sort of see what's happening inside the box. And then what we'll do is we'll make this box do various motions. The camera will record what's happening inside the box, how it looks inside the box. And everything is loose in here, is that right? Everything is loose. The sofa is free to move. Um, Grandma is free to move and the chairs and, All right. and everything. So one thing we can do is we can sort of put the lid on. And I think the most amazing thing that people <coughs> see when they go to the park is you're going through these amazing rides where you're going through loop the loops. And you don't fall out of your chair when you do it. You're upside down, but you're not falling out of your chair. And the reason has to do with the forces that are applied. If I take the box and I hold it like this, I can actually take it and swing it back and forth. And as we do that, we can see on the camera that it's pretty gentle inside the box. Not much happening inside there. And I can actually take it, swing it all the way over my head, like so, and it'll come back. Everything is still intact. Everything is, is right where we left it. Because I was applying an upward force from the point of view of the box. And that was the force that was keeping it moving in a circle. Now what the occupants of the box would feel would just be a force that would actually be pushing down. Um, and it's actually due to the inertia. The uh, occupants of the box want to move in a straight line. I'm making a move in a circle. Their inertia would cause them to feel pushed down into the box. And right. so what they'd feel is just a little extra gravity. But you don't fall out of your chair. Yeah, I think that happens a lot at Elitch's. It does. It does. <laughs> And that's what we're going to see next, because our next piece is we're going to go to the amusement park, we're going to ride some rides, talk about the physics that's involved, and talk about how they feel. Brian, I understand you can't come along on this one. No, I've got the bull ball and chain uh, to my desk here, so you'll have <laughs> to go without me this time. It, it's, it's, it's a tough job, but yeah. as I say, you know, someone's got to do it. <laughs> so we'll go have some fun at Elitch's right. and then come back and talk about what we saw. Look forward to it. All right. We're talking about motion today, and so we've come to a place where you can not only see motion, but you can feel it, you can experience it. And with me at our special venue is some special people. We've got Jeff and Derek, who tell me they've been waiting since eighth grade to be on a television show. Oh, yeah. I've watched every show, Matt. You're We're diehards. I'm glad, I'm glad you folks could be with us today. And we've got Amanda, Hi. and Maya, and David. Hi. And we're going to do some riding the roller coasters. Are you folks ready to ride some coasters? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 
but we're not quite ready to ride coasters because first we're going to talk about we're going to talk about some of the science behind the, the things that we're going to be experiencing today. Introduce some basic concepts. We'll ride some rides, come back, talk about what we feel, but we'll understand a little bit more about them. All right. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Basic concepts. Number one, speed. Speed is our first concept, and speed is basically how fast something's moving. And the way we define it is this: speed is a distance divided by a time. Now we're going to take an object here. We're going to take our little pink dune buggy. Cool. We're going to cruise it across the table. Oh yeah, there it goes. And oh yeah, stop it quick. There we go. And then Derek, if you could switch that thing off, we're going to send it across the table. And Amanda has a stopwatch. We're going to measure its speed. And by, to do that, we're going to measure a distance and then we're going to measure a time. Now this clipboard has a size of one foot. So I'm going to measure off from this wrinkle in the tablecloth here. One foot, two feet, three feet, right here to this point. So, Derek, we need to let that, that baby roll. Ready? Man Ready? is going to measure the time. Go! Go! Yeah. And there it is. Three. Three, three seconds. So we got three feet in three seconds. What's the speed? A foot a second. Six miles an hour. A foot per second. Yeah. A foot per second is it. And the way we get that is we divide the three feet divided by the three seconds and we come up with one foot per second. That's the speed. And that's our definition of speed, but you know that. That's something you've used before. Now, this is a concept that physicists have that most people don't think about. We got these two buggies here. We got the yellow one and the pink one. Jeff and Derek, I want you folks to set those off across the table. And let's see what we can say about the speeds of these two. Here we go. Ready? And go. Oh, oh no! <laughs> Better send them back. David, send them back. Send them back across the table here. Let's try not to collide them. And then tell me what you notice about the speeds of those two. There we go. There's one. There's two. Ready? Go. What do you notice about the speeds of these two? The same. The same. Same speeds. Okay, but wait. Go ahead and leave them going. If we take these two guys. And I, they, they definitely go at the same speed, but if I put them like this... Change direction. Change direction. Oh, yeah. The speed's still the same. What's different is, is the direction. Now, physicists say speed plus the direction is the velocity. So in this case, they have the same speed, but they have a different velocity. Different velocity. Different velocity. Thank you very much. Okay, now, Newton's laws. We're going to talk about Newton's laws. Newton's first law is this. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest. Stay at rest. And objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Basically, things try to keep doing what, what they're, they're doing. doing. And that's kind of a basic law of motion. Now, if we take this little puck here, this actually blows out air. And it's nice and frictionless if I put it on the table. So it kind of just floats there. But if I take it and set it still, it really doesn't move very much because it's at rest. And so it will have a tendency to remain at rest. Then again, if I give it a little shove, it tends to stay in motion until somebody else gives it a shove. So if it's at rest, it remains at rest. If it's in motion, it remains in motion. <laughs> oh, there we go. Shove with the truck. All right. Now, let's go ahead and take this puck here and talk about one other definition. If you have a change in velocity, we call that an acceleration. So for instance, if the puck's sitting here and it's not moving, its speed is zero. zero. And then it starts moving, that was a change in velocity because the speed changed. On the other hand, if it's moving this way and Derek pushes it back towards me, that's a change in direction. That is also an acceleration because the velocity changed. Oh, yeah. So, either way, change your speed, change your direction, that's an acceleration. Okay, and that, that's right. how we're going to define acceleration. Here's another thing. Acceleration is produced by a force. It doesn't happen spontaneously. Something has to push on something to make an acceleration happen. So, if we take this puck, we want it to accelerate, someone's got to push on it. I'm pushing on it, and then Amanda pushes on it, and then... Derek pushes on it. Oh, oh, and it's spinning too. Whoa. Wait a minute, you're getting ahead? Oh, That's right scene right two. Right okay. Whoa. Now, there are rides in the park that basically work like that. Ride, there's a ride in the park where you start out not moving. And then your velocity changes. Tower of Doom. Tower of Doom. So you start out, velocity is zero. 
Then gravity acts on you. Gravity makes a force that causes your velocity to change. You accelerate down and then hopefully you're moving and then at the end of the ride your velocity is going to have to go back down to zero again so that you can get off another acceleration. So you've got two periods of acceleration. But it's one that you just move in a straight line and your velocity changes. I have this theory about amusement park rides and my theory is that for amusement park rides to be interesting they have to involve an acceleration. That's my theory. So I'm thinking this is one you got a little acceleration at the beginning, acceleration at the end. Now there's another ride that's basically set up exactly the same way. Observation tower. The observation tower. They take you up real high and then they bring you back down to the ground. Real slow. Real slow. Okay, and we'll come back to that point. Now, we're going to have you folks ride these rides and sort of talk about it, and we're going to kind of divide the labor here. Jeff and Derek, I want you guys, if you're able to, observation tower, okay? Right. I think we can swing that. Okay, you guys ride the observation tower? Yeah, you folks, I want you to do the Tower of Doom. All right, hey, sounds good. We're going to come back together, talk about what you experienced, talk about some of the physics you're seeing. All right. We're going to talk about some more principles. Ride some more rides and keep on doing it. Okay. Okay, so ride some rides, come back and talk about that. We'll also look at some other kinds of motion before we come back. Then we'll rejoin here, talk about motion in a circle. Okay. Sounds good. No roller coaster at Six Flags Elitch Gardens goes faster than 70 miles per hour, and no ride goes higher than a few hundred feet. In fact, the highest ride is the observation tower which gives a great view, but not much of a thrill, as the boys will certainly report. The Tower of Doom is much shorter, but much more exciting. The Tower of Doom is all about changes in speed. Riders have dropped from a height of 220 feet and experience a bit more than two seconds of free fall, during which time they feel weightless, and reach a top speed of nearly 50 miles per hour, then slow down in just under one second. This stop is the acceleration that the riders really feel. This airplane is moving at a speed of over 600 miles per hour at a height of several miles. But it's not a thrill ride, as we can see by looking at the folks on the plane. The reason is the lack of acceleration. The airplane moves at a constant speed, which you can't feel. In fact, they look pretty bored. The roller coasters and other rides are all about changing speed and direction. That's what makes them fun. In fact, the fastest ride any of us will go on today is the van ride to the park. But since there's no acceleration, there's no excitement. All right, we're back, and we've seen some examples of motion, and you folks have had a chance to experience some motion and do a test of our basic amusement park hypothesis about, about acceleration. So I'm going to ask you about the ride. Okay. Tell me about the Tower of Doom. Um, it went pretty fast. You kind of felt your stomach drop. It wasn't. It was kind of scary, but not really. And fast. Was, yeah. Very fast. And when you uh, when you went up, you were you were all shaking and scared. And then it would stop, and then go down. It would, it went from a stopping point, and then all of a sudden went really fast, and it was really fun. Because it was like really slow, and it brought you up, and then it stopped like zero, and then it started going really fast again, and it was really fun. So it sounds like you're going, your velocity is zero at the top and then they drop you. And you said you yeah. get going very fast. Right. Yeah. And if you have a big change in your velocity, it means a big acceleration. Yes. So very, very good. And that's fun. And, it, and acceleration is good? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you guys got a chance to, to see the highest, the highest attraction in the park. It was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the ride as fun as, say, the Tower of Doom, do you think? Well, I don't know. It was very entertaining. We talked to a nice young man named Jeremy, but it wasn't that thrilling. No, even though it was higher, it was kind of slow. It's slow. Yeah. And that's the key. If you think about the acceleration, of course, your velocity doesn't change as much. And actually, most of the time, you're moving at a constant speed. So there's a little bit of acceleration at the beginning, maybe a little bit at the yeah, end. A little bit, not a little whole jolt. Yeah. Little jolt. jolt. And besides that, you're kind of just moving at a constant speed, like driving yeah. in the car on the way down. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot like that. Yeah. Except up. <laughs> Except a different direction. Yeah. Right. Different velocity. Different so velocity. Change, change directions. A beautiful, a beautiful thing. Right. Well, we're going to talk about some more concepts having to do with, the, with acceleration and looking at different kinds of motion. we got some going on behind us, I see. We're going to look at the Hot Wheels vehicles, which we have right here. And there's a couple of things I want to show. And Jeff, if you'd put the end of the track on there. Sure. Go ahead and hold it up in the air. And then we have a car here that we can put on the track. 
and we're going to put the car up on the track and let it go. Now this is like some of the attractions we're going to see in the park. Go ahead and let it go. Okay. And let's see what happens. Go little car. Oh, and oh, and there it is. Ooh, and it turned right. And yeah, Maya catches it. it. Thank you very much. So, there's a couple of points I want to make about this. One is, there's an acceleration here, because certainly it starts out at zero velocity. And then there's an acceleration as it works its way down the loop. But then when it goes into the loop, something else is happening. What happens inside the loop? It goes upside down. It goes upside down. And what changes? Not necessarily the speed, but what the does direction. change? The direction. So we got a change in speed, we got a change in direction, and then it kind of runs out at the end. One other thing I want to point out, they call them roller coasters. Did you ever think about why they call it a roller coaster? Because it rolls. Because it rolls, and because? It's on wheels. It was invented on the East Coast. Oh, shit. <laughs> it rolls and it coasts. The energy that you have in the coaster is all at the beginning. They pull you up to the top and then just let you go and you just roll and you coast all the way through. They don't put any energy in. So with the car, we go ahead and, let's go ahead and put that out there again. Come on, Jeff. All the energy it's ever going to have <laughs> is right at the beginning. If you put it up there and you let it go, it successfully goes through the loop. Lovely. How about if we don't put it up quite as high? So if we don't give it quite as much energy, a little lower. It won't go as fast. It won't go as fast. Ooh, that was looking a little scary in the middle of the loop. And a little less than that. Less, less energy in the beginning. That's not even going to go. Not as fast. Not enough fast to make it through the loop. Remember that. That's a point. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. That's a point. That's a point that we're going to come back to. Happen on one of these, we don't have And we don't want that. We're, we're taking you all home today, Dave. So we're going to go ahead and now take a look at the uh, this little vehicle here, which has got a little blue fluid at the top. And if you kind of look where you can see the fluid. Yeah. And actually, you all might want to, if you come around front a little bit, you can come around the front of the table so you can take a look at the fluid. I'm going to go ahead and let this run. Can you see? And I'm going to run this forward. What's inside here, this is what I call an accelerometer. It'll measure acceleration. If the fluid tips, that tells me there's an acceleration, okay? And if it's sitting flat, there's not. Right now, the velocity is zero. It's staying zero, so there's no acceleration. But I'm going to make it go forward. And I'll make it go backwards. Now, what did you see right at the start? Tipped a little bit, and then? and goes back down. Because what happens is velocity is zero, now it's moving. But when it's moving, it's moving at a constant speed. And that's why it's no fun in a car, because it just <laughs> Exactly, exactly. In the same speed, no acceleration, no fun. no fun, no fun. Now you also get a little bit of acceleration in the end, and this is what happens on the observation tower. Get a little bit of a kick at the beginning, a little bit of kick at the end, but in the middle, it's just, it's just steady. It's just steady. Now, we also have an accelerometer that we use that's a bigger version of this. And for this one, we can come back behind the table. I'm going to set this aside. We have another accelerometer here. And this one, big tank, two different kinds of liquid, just like with the other one. Except this one's not designed to move along a line. This one's designed to move it's by spinning. Give it a spin and make this thing kind of go around in a circle. Thanks. Yeah. I gave it a little spin. And then what do you notice about the liquid? It's dropping, it's dropping in the center. Down. Dipping in the center. And what that's telling me is there's an acceleration. And there's an acceleration not because the speed's changing, but what's changing? The direction. The direction. The direction is changing. The force is what makes it happen. Since there is an acceleration, that means there must be a force. And the bigger the change in velocity, in other words, the faster it's going. If I go kind of slow, it dips a little bit. And then if I go fast, it dips a lot. The bigger, bigger the speed, bigger the acceleration, and therefore, the bigger change you're going to see, bigger the force. Yeah. If you were riding this, you'd really, you'd feel that. OK, and the next piece we're going to look at is how, how does it feel? How does acceleration feel? Because, of course, the point of an amusement park is not what you do, it's what you feel. What you feel. Oh, yeah. So it's about feelings. It's all about your feelings. <laughs> and we're going to talk about our feelings a little bit now. And we're going to start off by bringing out our friend, the little green bunny on the hover puck. So we'll bring him out. Now, now the bunny sits on the puck here, like so. We're going to kind of ease him forward. And this puck will slide real well. I'm going to give it a shove forward, and I want you to tell me what happens to the bunny. So I'm going to let him sit here, give him a shove, 
Oh. He gets way back. Yeah. He goes backwards. I push him forward, he gets pushed back. <laughs> Let me tell you, what's happening too is this. If I push him forward, he wants to stay at rest because he's, he's at rest. And so he feels kind of pulled back and it's not a force that's pushing him back, it's just because he wants to stay put. So the bunny feels pushed backwards. I'm accelerating him in that way, he feels a push in that direction. And then if we shove him back, I'll go ahead and shove him back to him. To give him a good shove, oh, he feels pushed forward and back. And, whoa. Oh, no. and there, we he felt the acceleration of gravity right there. <laughs> you should have strapped him in. Oh. Yeah, the bunny, right. bunny, uh, we're gonna, he's stuck to the, he's stuck to the Velcro. Here we go, well, he's all right, he's all right. He's, he's gonna be okay. But I'll mention something about the Tower of Doom. You notice this. When you fall down, at least when I went on it, what I felt was everything going up. Yeah, your stomach leaks, your stomach yeah, comes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason is, you want to stay put. Right. But you're falling, and so everything kind of feels like it kind of comes up. We'll come back to that again. But you always feel a force in the opposite direction of your acceleration. Right. Now, there's another thing we'll show you with the other kind of acceleration we have, which is circular motion. And that uses this right here. I'm gonna take a cup, fill it up with some blue liquid, and the point of the blue liquid is just so we can see it. It's actually uh, this Vanish toilet bowl cleaner just to give us a little bit of a blue look. I'm gonna put it on this tray, and then the tray is kind of suspended from these strings. This is one you wanna give me a little bit of room for, just a little bit. You better not get us wet here. Oh no, even though it's a hot day. And if I take this and spin it, you can see the cup stays on the tray, even if I do it all the way, all the way over my head, it stays put. Matter of fact, I can also do it in a horizontal loop. I can do it, I can do it this way. And that'll stay put. Jeez. Sorry, that was a little close there, the wasn't it? Don't lose an eye. <laughs> and the cup, the cup will stay put. It'll stay put on the tray. And here's the thing to think about. I'm gonna go ahead and dump this out so I can talk about it. Yeah, that's gotta be great for the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. Now, when the, when the cup's up here, right? When the cup's up here like this, the water stayed in the cup when it was upside down. And so clearly there must be some sort of a, of a force that's making that happen. But what the cup feels is, it feels pushed outward from the center of the circle. And you talked about earlier a name for this force that it feels. Centrifugal force. Centrifugal force. It's a force you feel. When you go in a circle, you feel pushed to the outside of the circle. And so the cup feels that. Now what would happen if I did this, but it didn't go fast enough. It just falls. Fall. It would fall. It would fall. There's sort of a minimum speed you can do this. If I go too slow, that's what happens. There's not enough force to hold it in the circle. This is something you can do a version of this at home. It's folks that we have a, always have home experiments in everyday science. And I've got a couple of buckets over here that we can try. And Amanda, if you'd hand those to me, I need a couple of volunteers to sort of demonstrate who is our volunteer Derek and Amanda you need to step back and we're gonna give them a little bit of room you can if you spin these fast enough they'll go over your head but the thing is if you don't go fast enough there's not a centrifugal force and we all get wet I'm trusting you I'm gonna stand here we go so let's give it a shot oh yeah <laughs> a little bit of spillage but these folks don't mind Amanda let's give it a shot gotta go fast enough here it goes. She's got it. Oh yeah. Excellent. Oh yeah. That little girl showed me off. Let's say this is one. This is one you can try at home. It's one of our home experiments. Put water in a bucket. If you spin it fast enough around your head, the centrifugal force from that acceleration is big enough that it'll hold the water in the bucket. Um, it's one anybody can try. Time for some more rides. Ooh. Right. Time for some more rides. I'm ready. And this section we started talking about moving in a circle there's acceleration moving in a circle so we're going to do rides that involve going in a circle and we've got two good. of them we're going to look at one is the sidewinder which is a coaster that goes like this and then it goes in a big big loop and then you come out one big circle i want you to and i want you folks to go on that go on the sidewinder and feel what do you feel when you go through that circle what's the force that you feel pay a lot of attention to that and you guys we got another circle ride for you guys oh i'm ready it's the I'm carousel ready. 
the carousel. Yeah. It goes in a circle over and over again. Oh, right. Well, as long as Jeff holds my hand. Yeah, we can ride the horses. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's between you two. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead. I want you folks to go ride a ride. Okay. We're going to look at some video of a folks playing on the playground and see how some of these forces apply in the playground. We'll come back. We'll talk about that ride. We'll do some more physics, do some more rides. All right. And we'll be back. Okay. Let's do it. All right. If you move in a circle, you experience an acceleration as you change direction. And this acceleration makes you feel a force. Let's take a look at the Sidewinder. The cars are given a push and then roll down a hill through an inverted loop and then back again. The key part of the ride is the loop. If the cars are going fast enough through the loop, the riders will feel an outward force, the centrifugal force that we talked about. To help her concentrate on the feeling of the ride, Amanda is going on blindfolded. The riders will feel a centrifugal force that will push them into their seats, just like in the case of the water in the bucket, so no one falls out. And the feeling of acceleration is obviously something that David and Amanda enjoyed. The carousel is another ride that has you move in a circle, but at a much slower speed. The slow speed means a small acceleration. This is a very gentle ride. In fact, just to make it a bit more interesting, the horses move up and down, adding another kind of acceleration, but not too much. The principles that we have been talking about work just as well at the playground as they do at the amusement park. Acceleration is the key, again, whether it is the change in speed going down a slide or the change in direction while going around a circle on the merry-go-round. When you go on a swing, you have both kinds of acceleration. Your speed changes and your direction changes as well, and it happens over and over. What do you feel when you are on the merry-go-round? We said that when you go in a circle, you feel a force toward the outside of the circle. This student is holding a ball on the end of a string. As the merry-go-round spins, the ball is pulled toward the outside. The faster the rotation, the greater the force that is felt. Here is the distinction that we should mention. The centrifugal force that the ball feels isn't a real force. It happens because the ball wants to keep going in a straight line. But when you are moving in a circle, the force feels real. It's what holds you in your seat on the sidewinder. But, technically, the real force is the centripetal force, the force that makes the ball move in the circle. This force comes from the string and pulls in, not out. All right, we're back after another ride, and I think the clouds are rolling in, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch glasses here for a better view of the territory. I want to ask you all about the rides that you experienced. First off, the carousel. Action packed? It was really intense. Yeah. It was, it, it, it kind of went in a circle. I yeah. went up and down. Yeah, we went you, up and down. You know, you go in a circle, but it turns out the acceleration, I don't think it's large enough to be interesting. No. So what they do is, move you up and down. move you up and down a little bit more yeah, acceleration. Make up, really make up for it. Not, not so intense. Not so much. Now how about the Sidewinder? How was the Sidewinder? Was it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Now you went through the Sidewinder blindfolded. Yes, I did. And the emphasis on what you feel, what do you feel? Well, I mean, you can't really see what you're doing. So you're like excited, but your heart is pumping really fast because you're like, what's going to happen next and stuff. And after you go through the loop once, you're stalled there for quite a while and you're like, when am I going to go back? And when you go back, it's just a big shock. Because really, you don't know what's coming. Yeah, but it's really exciting. What force did you feel? What forces do you feel? When you go through the loop when you go through and the loop. stuff. Yeah. Do you and feel? when they push you like to go off. Did you feel so that you push? Go so you feel loop. a push when you start. Because you're just like sitting there and all of a sudden you go oh, like that. When you start, like, because there's only a little bit of room before you actually go like downhill. Whoops. Uh -huh. So when you start, you just kind of go slow and it's not that exciting and then all of a sudden it drops you and you feel like you're lifting up into your seat and then you do the loop, which you're going really fast and like you're just kind of not closing your eyes maybe and you don't really notice the loop too much. You don't except notice the loop the, too much. Except the, um, it feels, you can tell you're going upside down. Can you tell that? Yeah. I think, you know, you say when you fall and you feel like everything's going up, that's that free fall bit that we right. talked about before. When you go through the loop, you're actually like going in a circle, you get pushed out. So it's like the cup. Mm -hmm. You kind of feel pushed into your seat, yeah. which is probably why you don't notice the loop so much. Yeah. Now, if they went through the loop really slow, 
then you'd notice. Then you'd notice the leak. Yeah. But if you go through fast enough, you get pushed into your seat, and um, you, you won't notice it. It won't feel so much like it. Like After you've already gone around the loop once, and you're sitting there to go back around, just sitting there, when they push you off, you go backwards, because they push you backwards. Uh, 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 because they're pushing you backwards, and yeah. you go forward, because you want to stay still. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. I want to talk a bit about the whole the free fall idea. There's a lot of rides in the park that they do, like the big drop that you experience. You go down and you accelerate, but it's gravity that's pulling you down. And when gravity pulls you down, the feeling that you get is this thing called free fall. And it's a little bit different than other kinds of motion. I have an experiment for you two gentlemen to do. If you want to come around in front of the table, Derek and Jeff, this is a, a bottle of water. And I need you to go enough in front of the table so that we're not going to get wet. You guys are going to get wet, but we're not. The bottle of water, and if I hold it like this, I'm going to take the lid off. You can stand back a little bit first. If I take the lid off, you can see there's, there's holes in the side, and so water is going to spill out. But what I want you to do is I want you to toss this bottle back and forth. Now here's the thing. When the bottle's in the air, the water and the bottle are in free fall. They're all falling together. And so it's just like you when you're on the roller coaster, everything in your body is falling together, and so you feel weightless, actually. And so the bottle will feel weightless while it's in the air, and water won't come out of the holes. So I'm going to hand it to you, I'm going to unscrew it, and the trick is to not, not hang on to it very long. Keep it in the air as much as possible. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's enough. Set it down. Set it down. Whoa. And you can see while it's in the air, while it's in the air, you don't experience you don't experience very much in that. And the key, as I said, because it's 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 all about it's all about free fall. Now, actually, our free fall bucket, our free fall bucket works this way. This is a bucket. And you can see what we've done with it is we've got some tennis balls and they're hooked to elastic cords. And they hang over the side of the bucket, but the elastic doesn't pull the it doesn't pull the balls back into the bucket. And the reason is, what's the force that's holding the balls from being pulled back in? The weight elastic. The weight, the weights, gravity. Gravity's holding them from being done, pulled back in. But if I drop it, everything's falling together, it'll feel weightless. And so I'm going to drop it, and I think I'm just going to let it land on the table. And watch what happens to the balls when I drop it. They go in the bucket. Hey. In the bucket. In the bucket. So what happens is when it becomes weightless, all of a sudden they're floating, and these things are just floating, and the elastic cord pulls Kinda them right like in. like a parachute? Oh, like a parachute. You know, before you pull your parachute, it's like that. Because then you're free falling, and everything's kind of kind of coming together. Mm -hmm. I'll show you one more demonstration with that. We've got these little devices here called drone tubes that when you turn them upside down, they do the, the noise, oh, yeah. they groan. <laughs> so gravity is pulling a little thing down inside the tubes, and so you get that sound. But if you jump with the groan tubes, while you're in the air, you're in free fall. And so gravity doesn't act on them. Would one of you like to, I want you to hold this and then jump up and down. David, you want to give it a shot? Then hold them, and then turn it so they start making noise, and then jump up and down. <laughs> and what you get is, go ahead and try it again. Go ahead and turn them up. Oh, yeah. And while you're in the air, no noise. But of course, when you hit the ground, then you're stopping. There's a lot of acceleration, so you get a louder noise. I'm going to demonstrate. You can do it more dramatically if you can get higher off the ground with the pogo stick. So I'm going to try this with the, with the pogo stick. Same idea. And you get, if I turn them over, <laughs> and there's a wet floor here, which Who's makes it a little bit exciting. <laughs> Whose fault is that? So let's try it without the hat on dry ground. We'll do another shot of that. You're right. You're right. Okay, here we go. With the pogo stick, and we get. And you get a nice sound out of that, except not when you're in the air. That's what free fall is about. And that's why it's exciting, because you feel weightless. Where else would a person feel weightless? Space. 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 And it's not because there's no gravity. It's just because everything's falling together when you're in space. We're going to look at a little piece, a video, about how it feels in space and weightlessness. And while we're doing that, it's time to ride another ride. And this time, we're going to ride a whole bunch of them and think about all the physics that we've learned, how it applies to different rides. 
Which ride should we do next? Let's do Twister. The twi the Twister. Twister? Twister and then the flying coaster and then the boomerang. Twister, flying coaster, boomerang. An extreme case of free fall is seen in space travel. An orbiting spaceship, in this case the space shuttle, is essentially in free fall all the time. It falls, but it also moves forward, which means it falls in an orbit. But to the astronauts, it is always falling. Gravity still exists in space, but the astronauts will feel weightless as they are always in free fall. Most people don't get a chance to travel in space, but you can experience a brief period of free fall on the Tower of Doom. When the riders are dropped from the top of the tower, they are in free fall for just over two seconds. During this time, they will feel weightless. Another ride that gives a brief feeling of weightlessness is the Sea Dragon. Riders experience brief periods of free fall as the ship rises and then falls. Even your local playground can offer you the same thrill on a smaller scale. If you get going fast enough on a swing, you feel the same thing. Brief periods of weightlessness followed by periods of circular motion in which you are pushed into the seat. The feeling of falling that you get on a swing is the same feeling that makes a big roller coaster so exciting. The Twister 2 is a classic wooden coaster. It starts with a very big hill that the cars roll down, making the cars speed up and giving the riders a bit of the weightless feeling you get in free fall. The cars turn corners as well, making the riders feel a push toward the outside. During the two minutes of the ride, the speed goes from zero to 50 miles per hour and back to zero again, and changes direction from up to down and all the points of the compass. It's a series of accelerations from start to finish. The boomerang starts out with a big hill. The coaster falls and picks up speed, and then goes through a very tight loop. The speed is high and the loop is small, and so the riders feel pushed into their seats pretty hard. One of the best parts of the ride is that after riding forward, you go through the ride in the other direction, backward. The physics is the same, but since you can't see where you are going, you don't know what to expect, and so it's more exciting. The Mind Eraser is the biggest and fastest coaster at Elish Gardens. There's a lot of physics at work here. Riders experience a series of big hills during which the coaster gains speed as the riders feel a sense of free fall. They also go around inverted loops in which the coaster crests a hill with the riders upside down. And if that wasn't enough, riders fly through spiral sections in which they're spun upside down, fast enough to hold them in their seats. At the end of a hot day at the park, shipwreck falls might be just the ticket. All coasters work by having the cars go up a hill and then roll down. This potential energy is converted to kinetic energy of the coaster, the energy of motion. As the ride goes on, friction slows the cars until they come to a stop. In this ride, the car slows down by putting the energy of its motion into throwing a bunch of water in the air, soaking the riders and the folks standing nearby. Okay, we're back after riding a bunch of rides and experiencing some of the different thrills that Elish Gardens has to offer. Um, I want to ask you, what was the favorite thing that you got a chance to ride on today? Um, mine was actually the Tower of Doom and the Flying Coaster. I liked them both. Tower of Doom. What did um, you like about the Tower of Doom? It was very exciting. A lot of free fall. It was just very fun. Very free fall and a lot of acceleration at the end. How about you guys? I, I'm a purist at heart. I enjoyed the classic carnival. I enjoyed the carousel. The carousel. It was really great. Yeah. I had a great time. Yeah, the carousel it was good. Nice. It's yeah. just gentle. It's, it's a good thing. It is yeah. a good thing. Now, what do you think? My, our basic idea was that for a coaster ride or any of the rides at the park to be exciting, it has to involve acceleration. Yeah. Does that seem like that's true to you? Yep. Yeah. Got to change your velocity, change your direction, or change your speed. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. Our next, we want to say thanks. Um, to the people who helped us out being here today. I want to say thanks to Mike and Tara. Mike and Tara, come on on behind Hi. us here. Yay, yay. We've got a special treat for them. This is for our next show. In your honor, we're going to set off all of our rocket balloons. So go ahead and aim them up and let them go. Here we go. Go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's crazy, Mike. <laughs> all right. And this is my way of saying thanks to Mike and Tara. Thank you very much for having us here today. It was thanks a pleasure working coming. with you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And it also brings up our next show, which is going to be Flight. And Flight 
in order to make that happen. One way you can do it is to have some propulsion. Why that happens is something that we'll talk about. But first off, we're gonna go back to the studio, talk to Brian Oliver, and answer our quiz question. Then we'll see you next time on the next episode of Everyday Science for the physics of flight. So we're back after an action-packed day in the park with Brian Oliver to talk about where does this actually show up all this material show up in the kids schooling well that's a really good question and we do have teachers actually who take students to uh, Elitch Gardens uh, for physics day every year but um, it's interesting because what what the concepts that you're talking about are not only just in the state science standards but I have here a, a released item from the 2001 eighth grade uh, science CSAP test, which I, I think is pretty interesting. It says, look at the picture of a roller coaster below. The car on the roller coaster is released, from the, is released from the position shown and allowed to roll freely. And then there are three questions. Name the two forces that affect the motion of the car while it moves on the roller coaster. Question number two is describe how the potential and kinetic energy of the car change as the car rolls downhill and explain why the car cannot reach point X on the third hill as shown in the picture. Well, it turns out that when you look on the item map for this, which shows you basically the order of difficulty of questions, this question, students who could score three out of three on this, uh, were the, it was the most advanced score you could get. In other words, this is the most difficult question overall on the eighth grade science assessment. So I think it not only shows how difficult these concepts are to understand, but also when we talk about learning theory, how great it is to have those, those real world experiences with those forces to understand them. And I think thirdly, from a student's point of view, this is a great way to get uh, your folks, uh, I mean, it's on the test. You better get down there and uh, go <laughs> check it out because it's, uh, it really is important stuff. So I think that's pretty unique. Yeah. I mean, that, that is interesting. The, uh that it would show up in such a direct application. Yeah. And I think if you've had that experience, Absolutely. that's going to stick with you yeah, and you'll remember it, makes a, big it a lot difference. better. So you got to see it, but you got to feel it too. Right. And that's the whole point of doing hands-on science. Exactly. Every day. And it happens every day. It's amazing, isn't that's it? It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to close with one more experiment. And this is, a, this is a pretty zesty one that brings us to the topic of our next show, which is going to be flight. And we're going to talk about forces involved in flight right. as well. And one of the forces we talk about with flight is thrust. Um, and the way airplanes move forward is they push something else backwards. Jet engines will spew stuff right. out the back. And then Newton's third law tells us that the force you push backwards with produces an equal and opposite reaction that pushes you forward. And so we've got for you back here a, a chair with wheels and a little uh, carbon dioxide cylinder that we're going to use for some propulsion for you. And this is probably one of those that you don't necessarily want to try at home? You don't or? necessarily want to try this one at home. All right. But we'll be safe. Brian, I'm going to hand you the, hand you the cylinder Okay. here. And then you've got a nozzle on top. And then if you squeeze the, the lever, you're going to get a tremendous blast of CO2. So oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Always a good time. <laughs> and that's just one of the forces that we'll look at that have to do with flight and uh, how, how do you get things up in the air, how do you keep them in the air, how do you make them go places. That's the topic that's going to be the issue on the next episode of Everyday Science. See you then.